Well, good evening, church family. It's so good to be back with you here on Wednesday night for our Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, again, I'm extremely glad that you're with us tonight. So go ahead and get out your, your Bibles, your iPads, your iPhones, however you follow as long as Scripture, so you can follow as long tonight. We'll be in the book of Colossians. We'll be in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And we'll get back to the Scripture in just a minute. The title of our message for tonight is Philosophy or Christ philosophy or Christ. And we'll explore the scripture tonight as we look at that topic. You know, from the very dawn of, of mankind, the very dawn of recorded history, man has pondered the questions of the ultimate reality of life. We, we sometimes, uh, we say the, that people think about the meaning of life or what is the meaning of life. And that's kind of a, a universal question that uh, we all have asked ourselves from one time or another, and people always ask that question universally. You know, what is what is what does life mean? What is what is the meaning of our existence, our own personal existence? Why am I here for? What are, what am I supposed to be doing? And so those questions always come up. Questions like, who am I? Have you ever asked that question? I heard someone uh, ask that question? Who am I? Or, or why am I here, or where am I going? These are all, I believe, universal questions asked by the whole human race. It's just as we think about the, the quote-unquote meaning of life, we, we begin to ask those questions. And uh, we think of that as we, as we think of that tonight. We're going to look at the, the idea of philosophy, this, this concept of philosophy. And, and the first thing I want us to, to make sure that we realize is that when we look at this idea of philosophy, philosophy is inept to, to answer any of the questions uh, that we're going to talk about tonight. It, it just is not adequate to do that, even though people... Uh, want to think about that. And really, we talk about philosophy. What What is philosophy? And, and I think if we break it down, if we break down this word philosophy, it comes from two separate Greek words. The f first word is a phialo, or to love, to, to love. So remember that phialo, or phialo, to love. And the second word is sophia, which means wisdom. So the idea when you break down this, this word philosophy, it's the love and pursuit of wisdom. That's how you could, could explain it, the love and pursuit of wisdom. Well, that's a mouthful as we get started here tonight as we think about that. We we think about people and we think about the, the fact that we, have, we all have our own ideas. We're all individuals. We all are made differently. And we all have our own worldview of how things are, are made up. In one sense, everyone, everyone is a philosopher. Not everyone is, uh, thinks of themselves as a philosopher, but everyone really is because we all have a worldview, a world concept of how things could be. Throughout history, there's, there's also been those who specialize in the academic discipline of philosophy. We have people who, who study philosophy. I studied philosophy in college, and I'm sure that uh, many of you did the same thing. And so, uh, we, but we have academics who, who make their life study to be philosophers, so to speak. Most of the philosophers that we've had throughout history, uh, as we think, Think about this idea of philosophy, and it's a it's a it's a concept. And most most people who philosophize or ph philosophers, they deny the very existence of God. Or if they if they think about God, or if they mention God, or if God comes into the picture, it's almost always an unbiblical viewpoint of God. And so. Ever since man's rebellion against God has driven him 
to the line of despair, we've had those who have always tried to philosophize about life, try to figure life out. In the matter of fact, in the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans, the first chapter, verses 21 and 22, he says this, he says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. They accepted the existence of a higher being, God, but they did not honor him. They did not give him thanks, but they became futile in their reasoning and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. People sit around and philosophize about life, think about the meaning of life, and philosophers make up their own version of what they think the meaning of life is, and in reality, they have no idea what it really represents because we see the, in the God's Word, it says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. By eliminating God and his revelation from the picture, modern philosophy has, has really plunged man into the abyss of just ignorant darkness and hopeless despair. So the more we philosophize about life, the more we try to figure things out, and the more we, especially when we take God out of the picture, the more futile it becomes. The more, the more exasperated we become because we can't figure out anything because when we take God out of the picture, God is the central theme of everything. And when you take the central theme of everything out, when you take God out of the big picture of life, there is no life. There is no existence. God is the creator of all things. He is the creator of life. And so if you take him out of that picture, then you can philosophize all you want about what is the meaning of life, but you'll never understand, you'll never bring it to any fruition to in your own heart and in your own mind to, to make sense out of it all if you don't accept the fact of who God is and the fact that He created all things. He is sovereign God. He's a creator of all things. If you leave God out of the picture, it never makes sense. And so, one of the things that Paul was dealing with with the Colossian church was those who were philosophers, those in the church who were trying to explain the meaning of all things. The church had faced the danger of being infiltrated by false teachers and te those who were teaching heresy. And we even find that today in our own religious world today. Many of our many of our so-called churches today are in, infiltrated by false teaching. And remember to many, many times false teaching is 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 made to sound so good and to say sound so close to the truth of God's word, but if you pay attention, there's a big big difference. So the church throughout history fought to maintain doctrinal purity. Even today, we fight over and over again to keep the reality of, of the world out of the church, to, 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 to fight for the, the truth of the Word of God, the doctrinal purity and doctrinal truth of the Word of God. And we, we have to fight for that daily. We have to be on guard. We have to be standing up and watching out and being careful. And that's what Paul's trying to do with the church at Colossia. This was Paul's heart's desire to protect the church from the attack of false teachers. So we looked at, last couple of weeks, we looked at verses, second chapter, verses 1 through 7. And in those scriptures, Paul exhorted the Colossians to maintain their allegiance to both the deity and the complete sufficiency of Jesus Christ. The deity of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. He is God. He is sovereign God. He is Lord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, creator of all things. And he is completely 100% sufficient in all that he does. So that's what Paul was fighting for. And that's what we're going to kind of see as we look at the text tonight. It's not God and something. It's God and God alone. So in verses 8 through 10, which we're going to look at tonight, Paul begins to attack the first element of the Colossian heresy, and that's false 
philosophy. False philosophy. So, uh, by way of a, a warning, let's say about by way, he contrasts, and that's what we're going to look at tonight for just a few minutes. So, uh, hang in there with us. The contrast between the deficiency. Did you hear what I said? The deficiency of philosophy with the sufficiency of Christ. All right, let's look at the scripture first, and we'll begin with verse 8, and we're going to look at the deficiency of philosophy. Colossians, the second chapter, verse 8. It says, See to it that there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with the elementary principles of the world, rather than in accordance with with Christ. He says, be careful. He says, watch out. Don't let yourself be fooled. Don't let yourself be deceived by, by philosophy or human tradition. Paul's concerned that those who have been transferred from Satan's domain to Christ's kingdom not become enslaved again. We were enslaved by sin when we were lost now people have been saved, and Paul is wanting them to be very careful they don't fall back and let themselves be enslaved again by false doctrine, false teachers, false philosophy, uh, or human tradition. Don't fall back and get caught up in something else when it, you don't need any of that. And the whole thing was, it's Christ and something else. It's God and something else. It's Jesus and something else. And what Paul is definitely trying to explain is that it's Christ alone. In Christ alone is all we need. So Paul's concern was that they were going to let Satan's deception through philosophy and, and, uh, and, and really tradition pull them back into that that realm of being enslaved. He voiced a very similar concern to the church at Galatia. In Galatians 5, 1, he says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. The, 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 the nation of Israel knew what slavery meant very well. They also knew what freedom meant very well. And what Paul was trying to say to them is, don't, now that you're free and you're free indeed in Christ Jesus, don't fall back into that slavery. The church constantly faced the danger of false teaching. Jesus says in Matthew, Matthew 7, 15, he said, beware of false prophets. There's always going to be false prophets. We have them today. We have them by the hundreds, by the thousands. We have false teachers and false prophets. He says, beware, beware of false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. False teachers who come to you disguised in those sheep's clothing. Make it look so pretty. Make it look so believable. Make it look so right when a all along, it's all wrong. It's all wrong. He says, they'll come to you in sheep's clothing, but they're actually ravenous wolves. Just like Satan seeks out whom he may devour, he seeks out those that he can, he can gobble up. And that's what, that's what the scripture's saying here. Don't be deceived by all that. He says, he says watch out. Be careful for those false prophets. And, and, and please, let me caution you as much as I can to, to read the Word, study the Word, find the reality of the Word in your own heart, in your own life, because the more in-depth study of the Word that you have, the God's truth, the Bible, not, not books, be careful, there's nothing right. I have a library full of books. I have a library full of study guides. I have a library full of, full of uh, uh, books that I read all the time. But be careful, there is only one book that should teach you truth and doctrine, and that's God's Word. Everything else is man's writing. 
So remember that. Be careful. Don't just read something because somebody who's famous or somebody who you see on television wrote a book and you read it and you say, well, it's, you accept it as a truth. No, no, no. Do not not do that. Do not get caught up in that. The truth is God's Word. Study God's Word. Let all the other things come as you see that you can use them and benefit from them, but never let them take, never let another book, never let another writing take the place of the Word of God. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 15, he, again, he says, Beware of the false prophets. Jesus warned again in Matthew 6, 16, he says, And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Paul specifically warned him to be careful that no one takes you captive. It would surely grieve the heart of any pastor, any pastor worth his salt, to learn that the the spiritual children he, who he was responsible for, their, their spiritual maturity, became susceptible to the dangers of false teaching. If a pastor, if it would break his heart to know that, that, uh, that his, his congregation, his, his people that he was responsible for fell back into captivity because of false teachers in the church one of the primary duties, I think, of church leaders is to guard the flock, to guard the flock. I am so grateful for our pastor that we have here at Germantown Baptist Church, Brother Matt. I, I just, I'm so grateful that he is not afraid to, to preach the full gospel, the full truth of the Word of God. He doesn't shy away from the hard subjects. He, he preaches the Word. He, he gives it all to you. All to you, and I am grateful for that. We don't have to worry about false teaching because he studies to find himself approved. Uh, this, this word that he preaches, he preaches from the word of God. And that's what a good pastor should do, a good teacher should do. But understand, it's that you need to understand the word. So a good pastor needs to keep his flock from being kidnapped by the enemy. And it happens all the time. It happens. Let's look at our, this is a long scripture, but I want you to see this in Acts 20, verses 28 through 32. Now, over and over again in the scripture, we are warned. We get warnings all the time. And many of them are harsh, stark warnings about what we should do and what we should be careful of and what we should watch out for. And we don't listen to the word many, many times. Look what it says. It says, be on guard for yourself and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among you, your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. I, in other words, I prayed for you. For years I prayed for you. I pray that, that you would not fall susceptible to false teachings. And he says, and now I trust you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Remember, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And the only power that Satan has over me is power I allow him to have because of my weakness. And the only weakness I have is because of my lack of holding on to the strength of God. I am weak in myself, but in God I can do all things who strengthens me. So I have power. I have might. I have God's might. Remember that. 
Remember that. Hold on to that. Paul describes the means the false teachers would use to kidnap the Colossians as philosophy and empty deception. Paul gives two sources of vain speculation, the tradition of men and the elementary principles of the world. Tradition is that which is handed down from one to another. I have heard so many people quote Scripture that is inaccurate. What they quote is, is things that they hear, things as sayings that come, are passed down through tradition. They're, you'll never find them in the Word of God, but they accept them to be true because they've passed them down, they've heard them over and over. Many things that, that, that we accept are just things of tradition, not things of reality of the truth of the Word of God. They're tradition. Just because people have believed something and handed it down through the years does not make it true. We, we see that over and over again. Tradition usually serves, usually just to perpetuate error. It's, uh, it's kind of like that, that idea of have you ever played the game where you, you tell somebody, you have a line of people and you tell somebody something besides you and they're supposed to repeat the same thing to the person beside them and the person beside By the time you go through two or three people, it's changed a lot. But by the time you go through eight or ten people, what I said on this end is nothing like what somebody thinks they heard on the other end. That's the way tradition is. It gets passed down and passed down and changed up and changed up. But we accept it because it kind of sounds right. It kind of sounds like it's the right thing. But tradition merely serves to perpetuate error. So that's what you have. The elementary principles of the world, we might be referring to growing mature Christians that are fooled by the very basic errors that they've been taught over and over again. We, we get taught worldly things. We get taught the principles of the world, and we apply those to the principles uh, that we are accepting that we say come from the Word of God and have nothing to do with the Word of God. Um, many times we get caught up in those worldly principles. You know, uh, we live in the world, and if we're not careful, the world will consume us. But even though we live in the world as a child of God, we're to be separate from the world. To, we're to be a separate and unusual people. In other words, we're to, we, as a child of God, we should stick out like a sore thumb living in this messed up world that we live in today. I ought to have a thousand amens out there to that. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, look around. Has there ever been a time when the world was any more messed up than it is now? And God's people ought to be shining. God's people ought to be standing out. God's people ought to be a beacon in this dark, dark world for people to see. So we see the deficiency of philosophy, but now for just a few minutes, I want us to look at the sufficiency of Christ. Look, look at verses 9 and 10. The sufficiency where the philosophy was so deficient and inadequate, God is adequate. God is sufficient. Christ is sufficient. It says, For in Him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and in Him you have been made complete, and He is the head over every ruler and authority. I think this is the most blessed passage that we have on the deity of Christ in all the Scripture. It presents the glorious, majestic majesty of Christ's person, not just His person, but His complete sufficiency as God. Verse 9 is perhaps the most definite statement of Christ's deity that we have in the epistles. It is the rock upon which all attempts to disprove Christ's deity are shattered. As a result of the fall, man is in a sad state of incompleteness. Ever since man sinned, ever since the original sin, ever since the garden, ever since Adam and Eve, we have been an incomplete people. Look at this. I want to look at three things real quick. He is spiritually incomplete. We are spiritually incomplete because he is 
totally or we are totally out of fellowship with God. A person who is out of fellowship with God is totally incomplete. We are morally incomplete because we live outside of the will of God. We're spiritually incomplete because we live out of fellowship with God. We're morally incomplete because we live outside the will of God. We're mentally, mentally incomplete because we do not know the ultimate truth of God. And then, and then, or but now, salvation the sufficiency of Christ. It's salvation. Believers become partakers of a divine nature and that incompleteness we're now made complete in Christ Jesus. 2 Peter 1.4 Through these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of divine truth having escaped the corruption that is in the world on the account of lust. Just as we were incomplete before, now believers are spiritually complete because they have fellowship with God. Salvation brings fellowship to God. We have been, we were incomplete when we were lost. Salvation comes and now we've been made complete. Believers are spiritually spiritually complete because now we're in fellowship with God. We're morally complete because we have come under the authority and recognition of the authority of God and God's will in our life. We are mentally complete because we know the truth and the ultimate reality of who God is. To maintain, as the Colossians heiress did, that those who were made complete in Christ still lacked anything, is absolutely absurd. Once we were lost in our sin, once we found Jesus, we were made complete. Not partially, but 100% complete. Not within ourselves, but because of Christ Jesus. 2 Peter 1.3 For in His divine power, not my power, not your power, in His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. All true believers are complete in Christ and do not need the teaching of any cult or false teacher. We don't need anything else. Anything else. Everyone has a choice to make whether to to follow human wisdom or to come to Christ. You cannot rationalize Christ. All you can do is believe Christ. The philosophers would try to have you rationalize Christ. They couldn't do it, neither can you, because He is God. He is God. To follow human wisdom is to be kidnapped by the emissaries of Satan and his false system, which leaves a person spiritually incomplete. To come to Christ is to come to the one who alone offers completeness. May we never, ever doubt the sufficiency of Christ Jesus in all things in our life. Philosophy full of deficiencies, it'll never work. Christ Jesus is sufficient in all things for all you need for all time. God bless you for being with us tonight. Uh, I hope that you have a good rest of the week and are blessed. And I hope Christ puts someone in your path that you can share him with this week. God bless.